Good, well, good afternoon, everybody, uh, and welcome to the second seminar in this uh, first series of the new Axon Johnson Centre for the Study of Classical Architecture here at University of Cambridge, and we're in Downing College, where the centre is housed. We've got about uh, 15 people in the room with us here, and I know a large number of people joining us online to listen to this afternoon's seminar, so a warm welcome to everybody, both who's in person and who's uh, joining online. My name is Frank Salmon, I'm the director of the new centre. It's a pleasure to welcome you and do please check out our website where you can find out much more information about what we're doing, what our, uh, events are on, on offer and so forth. Next week's seminar uh, will be Professor Anthony Geraghty, who will be talking with the uh, sparse but informative title of Hawksmoor and Utilitas. Um, but this week it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker Mark Wilson-Jones, who probably to most of the audience both here and online needs little introduction. Uh, Mark is one of the great authorities on the architecture of the ancient world with two um, uh, extraordinary books to his credit, Principles of Roman Architecture and Origins of Classical Architecture. Uh, his great insights to the architecture of the Greek and Roman worlds are in part due, I think, to his um, professional training as an architect. In addition to his academic career, uh, Mark is also running a successful architectural practice, Apollodorus Architects. So, Mark, without further ado, um, it's a great pleasure to welcome you here to the Axon Johnson Centre for the second talk. And uh, we look forward very much to hearing what you're going to tell us about when copying is really copying when it isn't really copying. So, over to you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Frank. <clears throat> Thank you very much indeed for that kind introduction and to Elizabeth for all this wonderful coordination and, of course, to Downing College and above all to um, the Axon Johnson Foundation, who is making Oh, I should say, which is a grammatical slip this early on is really terrible, um, which is uh, enabling all of this uh, wonderful activity. And it's an honor to be a small part of this important endeavor. So when is copying really copying and when it is not copying? Um, the point about this really is that copying is a highly charged word. It can be uh, it's generally disparaging and used almost in an insulting way. It can be. Um, but for people who are interested in tradition, it's much more at ease with the whole concept of imitating or deriving or learning from the past. So really, I want to um, bring together some historical observations on that with an edge that's looking forward to contemporary practice. So um, I think as an architect and by the way, I should say that I used to practice exclusively non-classical, non-traditional buildings when I was younger. Um, I think you can say that the holy grail for contemporary architects, and along with a fair proportion of the clients and developers that employ them, is to come up with some ingenious inversion of previous forms and habits and customs, and to start afresh, ideally from some kind of radical concept that can be possibly encapsulated and so conveyed quickly to the media through some diagram or simple notion. So a concomitant mindset is to marginalize history and to eschew tried and tested solutions. And <clears throat> to help persuade this is us that this is necessary, traditional and especially classical forms are portrayed as derivative. That is to say, dependent on copying, rules, formulas, and so on. But from the perspective of an architectural historian, um, this is rather counterfactual. When you think that on the one hand, classical and traditional design, as I hope to show, really fits uh, this characterization. And on the other, modern buildings often display no lesser degree of dependence on copying and formulas. It is only that perhaps that the mechanisms of derivation are better disguised or our attention is distracted. Distraction can be provided by those iconic structures that garner media attention, often by the inversion strategy I just mentioned, that is to say, standing things on the head, so to speak, combined, combined perhaps with some shock value and bravado. And let's admit it sometimes, um, some undeniable cleverness. But beneath the surface, we often sense a paradoxical um, feeling of sameness. 
And it's ironic too that repetition and seriality is a modern artistic technique to name just Andy Warhol. So it would be fascinating to interrogate the seduction of all this cool, the standing of things on their head and claims to be free of copying, but that isn't what we're here for uh, today. Let us just remind ourselves that gimmicks tend to date quickly. Whatever the reason, we are all familiar with relatively um, recent buildings being demolished after a shorter life lifespan than is typical for traditional buildings, which can often be patched up and refurbished and adapted. Moreover, it is in the nature of tradition by reflecting shared cultural patterns, uh, not to engender alienation. In short, more space should be given to emulating and improving the tried and tested in the cause of making places where people feel they can belong. Now, we're gonna focus actually on the matter in hand and the question of precedent and copying. As I've said, classical and traditional architecture and the architects who make it are quite at ease with both. But this is not tantamount to stagnation. There can be novelty, surprise and progress, and they can bring both pleasure and utility. Classical thinking accommodates the new on the spectrum from imitation to invention. It also provides a framework for learning any kind of skill. And when we think that obviously children learn from their siblings and their parents and then from their teachers, and in a kind of apprentice scenario, you have apprentices learning from their masters. And then a typical educational technique is to involve a certain amount of copying. Um, <clears throat> and then from that, you go on to practicing exercises of various kinds. Um, and then ideally, you and hopefully you assimilate principles of a more abstract and more profound sort to then to go on to create your own new um, manifestations of this living tradition that you're part of. So the trajectory from imitation to invention can clearly be observed, particularly well, in fact, in the workings of Renaissance workshops. But evidently, this did not hamper the creativity and the vision of figures like Leonardo da Vinci or Michelangelo, and indeed others um, that were held, along with those two in particular, to actually having surpassed their forebears. So we, we know that from figures like um, Vasari. So they actually surpass what went before. So this is emulation. This is the goal of all this uh, copying or quasi copying or, and so on exercises. Um, invention of course works best where there is a purpose or justification for there is still value in the old dictum that necessity is the mother of invention. When not underpinned by collectively shared needs that is the problem with novelty. That is when um, gimmicks and so on bring only temporary uh, stimulation and satisfaction. So before getting underway with the usual combination of uh, copy and image, uh, word and image in the form of the new tradition of the PowerPoint, uh, I just want to give you some brief personal uh, notes in a sense, just slightly extending what Frank uh, said. So I uh, trained as an architect at Cambridge, in fact, and then I was lucky enough to get the Rome Scholarship, which meant two years um, studying uh, ostensibly Peruzzi and indeed Peruzzi at first, but then essentially following my nose in Rome. And then there's no better place to follow your nose. And that led to some discoveries and then publications and then trying to get them out while uh, still working as an architect. But over the years, the practice suffered. So uh, in a sense that I became a full-time academic eventually. Um, and But the experience of practice is to me, um, as Frank mentioned, I hope this is the case, it rather, um, informs and helps the insights in the process of studying, particularly in the case uh, where, as, in, as is uh, true of myself, I'm interested in design. Okay. So um, I hope it's been useful, all this um, previous activity. Anyway, um, but uh, in terms of the sort of recent uh, and this talk, I came up with the idea, rather than continuing of working directly on Greek and Roman architecture, that it would be great to go back to, um, first of all, my favorite people in the 16th century, 
and onwards to actually devise a project, a research project that embraced the two. And I called this from uh, emulation to replication, which was going to be the kind of vehicle by which I would uh, look to the use of ancient precedent in the early modern period and possibly down to today. So in this, the words emulation and, and copying are, are key. So um, I think without more, uh, let's say semi-scripted uh, wording. Oh, I'm sorry, my mouse is in Zoom, which is no, no, that's fine. I've, my mouse now is, I think in, um, yes. Right, so on precedent and copying. Now there are, sorry, we haven't, no, now we have it, now we have it. So this is an image from Persepolis or very near Persepolis. And we have these three uh, dynastic tombs, which are incredibly similar. Now, actually, I'm not going to pontificate on these because not being an expert in this kind of area, I can't say how close they are to one each other, really, in very precise terms. But at least to the uh, non-specialist eye, they seem to be incredibly similar. So it's really quite clear. You have the model, and then the next king wants to uh, follow in, in the footsteps of his predecessor and so on. And you get these really quite exact copies. So the concept certainly did exist in antiquity. And of course, we've all been in museums. And nowadays, I must say, I, I view these labels with increasing irritation. You know, Roman copy of a Greek original, usually applied to a sculpture. Now, there are cases uh, clearly where this is, this is operating depending on the, let's say, precision with which you use the word copy. So we have here a series of caryatids based on the left, uh, most one, the caryatids from the Erechtheion on the Acropolis in Athens. And then you have an example from the Forum of Augustus and then one uh, later from um, Villa Adriana in uh, Tivoli. So these are pretty close. To one another. They're not exact, and you can tell by looking at little details. But we have to um, remember that these are architectural elements. So there is a logic to the seriality of them, of the similarity of them, because they are functioning as supports. When you get to uh, sculpture, and I um, show here the cover of um, this, uh, the book that came from this wonderful exhibition in Milan, um, curated by Salvatore Settis. And you can straight away see there in, in these statues, they've got an awful lot in common. They're definitely looking to what we would call a type, the same type, but by no means could they be um, said to be identical and so on and so on. One can look at all kinds of uh, ancient sculptures with this principle. So um, if you just look at the hair, of this head, these two heads, you can see there's very uh, definite stylistic um, or similarity about them because it's all about recognition. You have to recognize this figure, but actually whether it's the tilt on the head or other aspects, um, they, there are subtle differences. So it's not a form of mechanical copying or anything related to say the plaster copying in the 18th century, 19th century of ancient prototypes. There's um, something going on, and I would say it's more akin than people realize to variations on themes. Now, when you get to architecture, whereas I should say for sculpture, I don't think anyone has quite worked out how those sculptures achieved those variations and themes. When it comes to architecture, you can actually manage to do this because you have um, measurements you can compare like to like and so on. And you often know the feet involved, you know, all, there's all kinds of context which helps you uh, be able to make comparisons, say, between the three Doric temples you see there. Um, and, uh, oh, it's a file I later, this is not the latest file. I hope it doesn't cause us problems in future because the earliest one is at the bottom, and I had actually reconfigured it to go at the top. And uh, anyway, there, there, there's this slight chronological, let's say, uh, embarrassment there. Mm -hmm. But anyway, these temples were are very similar, but it's not as if 
the, uh, a later one looks back to an earlier one in the manner of taking it and adapting it. Okay, so it's not a tweaked copy of the predecessor. These buildings are independently arrived at by working from common or shared principles. And it's in the manipulation of those principles differently understood by different creative individuals that you get um, subtle differences between the buildings. The other thing we have to remember is that in this case, the similarity, the extreme similarity between these buildings in overall terms is due to their highly conventional status. They are temples. So um, society at this time would want these to be um, pretty consistent and conventional. It wasn't the role for personal expression uh, or caprice or any of those things, obviously. Um, now, when you look to the methods, different scholars have come up with different methods. Um, I hope I've got it right with my uh, proposal, which is essentially looking to Vitruvius to some extent, because he bases his methods on modules, but to realize that the module involved was not half the column diameter, as he said, but was the triglyph width. And then there's a, a further little tweak because if you mm, realize that triglyphs often tend to be um, slightly tweaked according to where they fall on a frieze, uh, along with the metopes, that actually you have to work out what the nominal ideal triglyph module was. And then suddenly they drop out and they drop out with extreme precision. So when we look at Sunian there, say for example, that two to one proportion that's indicated by a diagonal line, which doesn't mean any geometry or diagonals was used in the actual design back then, it's just purely a graphic aid, um, that two to one proportion is extremely accurate and so are many of the others. So you can, uh, if you look at it in modular terms and you can see those numbers like four, 12, 16, 24, and so on, it's obvious that this is in the goal of symmetry of proportional harmony. And that's what they aim for, but no two designers did it in exactly the same way. So here are four uh, temples, which I don't, you know, you don't need to look at individually, but um, proportions tend to get more slender over time. And as you do that, other adaptations come in and new proportions become um, more, let's say, um, useful to the designer than previous ones. So, but I say to ram home the point, this is working independently from the principles they shared it's not taking temple A and modifying it to make temple B. Uh, I just, a little bit of recent work, so I published that, that previous stuff all the way back in 2002, but uh, um, two or three years ago, I published a study of the Parthenon, which I had been sitting on for around 20 years because you don't want to get the Parthenon wrong um, because it didn't quite uh, fit or I was a bit baffled why, when in modular terms, you get these very simple conversions to the famous four to nine proportion, which takes place in two ways. In other words, column height of 16 works as four to nine to 36 width, which works as four to nine as the 81 module length. All of that is absolutely sweet, but the total height of the building is 14 and six sevenths modules. You know, well, why, why, why would anyone do that? And I don't know, it must be stupid, but it took me something like 12 years to realize, oh, the curvature is a seventh. Oh, that 17 and six sevenths. Oh, that makes 18. Oh, that makes half of 36. Oh, so, you know, um, I, there we are. I think it's part of the same series, except that it's eight columns wide and it has particularly, uh, you know, other features which you, you may or may not know about. But, Anyway, so it's all part of this world of operating with principles, manipulating them according to the individual context and circumstances of the uh, project in question and coming up with your variant. Now you can, I'm now going to race through um, the next series of slides because I think really what I've said there is the main message and it, and it applies to the next two or three categories of things I'm going to show you. Um, it more or less applies to Greek, uh, sorry, Roman Corinthian temples, but not the modular method. There was a quite different 
Roman um, <clears throat> way of designing the Corinthian column, which came into force around the Augustan period. And um, so we have a situation where, and this is why mensuration and checking measurements is so important. On that um, slide there, you can see that there's two images of the Temple of Mars altar, the left photo and the central drawing. And then uh, that involves, that involves uh, 60 foot columns. And over on the right, you have the Temple, the, the Maison Carré in Nîmes, which has 30 foot columns of the same proportions in this case. And this is quite an example where you almost could phot photocopy, as it were, the columns of the Temple of Mars altar, but not other features, and reduce them down to make those of the Maison Carré. But this is aided by the fact that possibly it, it was an itinerant workshop who actually, uh, the, the craftsman actually carved those details, or it was one heavily influenced by the workshop that made the Temple of Mars altar. So <clears throat> this kind of congruency is relatively rare, but still remember that one is an octostyle building, the other is a hexastyle, there's different details and, uh, and so on. Now, uh, this is the method of uh, encapsulation of the method they used, which is a highly intelligent sort of architectural system, because what, the, what this does is guarantee you the essential family qualities of the family you are wanting to belong to, the recognizability of it, this recognition idea is, is very important. You, you uh, have a properly designed Corinthian column if you use these proportions. At the same time, it leaves free uh, how slender the column is. They can be fatter or thinner because the Vitruvian um, rule doesn't really apply. They use slenderness ratios, but it didn't have to be, they didn't have to be fixed. And your base could be smaller, your capital taller, or vice versa. And of course, the capitals can be different and the moldings of the base different. And so you can end up with quite different products using the same principles. And the, um, there's a series of equalities between the red things and the blue things. And then they have a simple relationship one to other by say a ratio like seven to six or eight to nine or nine to 10. And according to which the ratio you choose, you get your different results. And then of course there's individual caprice on top of that and the carvers adding their detail. So in the end you get um, quite different products. And I make the analogy with say trees or human beings, you know, there's a familial resemblance when you see an oak, you know it's not a pine, you know it's not a eucalyptus and so on but no two oak trees the same. No one in the audience is the same, let alone uh, that we're all you know, out there in the larger world, but we're all human beings. So I think this um, natural principle, which Vitruvius enunciates, yeah. doesn't make clear exactly how you achieve it. Uh, I think this is a manifestation of, of that. And then uh, going forward, you can see uh, it was actually enshrined in the previous diagram the red X dimensions there, you can see that conceptually, the cross section of a Corinthian capital is square, one-to-one. -one. It's a beautifully easy proportion. But if you look at those profiles in the bottom three drawings, they're all quite different. And then I make the point here with a series of capitals, and you can do this over a huge range of time that actually have quite accurately or reasonably accurately the same proportions, but are entirely different visually. Um, now, uh, let's just race over amphitheaters because it's the same old story. C a completely different type of building, a Roman invention. Um, I'm not even really showing you any examples except uh, in, in the last slide, very quickly. There's two main methods of designing these things with either an equilateral triangle or a Pythagorean triangle, which gives you lots of practical advantages. But then you have other things that come into play, which means that the um, buildings start to be different. So although many of them have a shared arena proportion, because they're either following the equilateral triangle or the three, four, five triangle, when you get to add the caveat, uh, the seating, there's a different, different depth of that seating. So the buildings start to become different. Um, and then actually, if you sort of, try and follow all the various paths you get. Um, this is the sort of tree analogy in, a, in another sense. You could think of it as roots. 
but effectively you get a sort of bifurcation and then further subdivisions, further choices, further decisions, which are uh, project specific. And then you end up with a whole uh, load of different amphitheaters. And it's quite remarkable considering the number we have, how few are actually that similar to each other. I'm gonna show you those two now, or the two that are most similar, where they're quite near to each other in the south of France. Those are Al and Nîmes. And it's possible uh, that either the designer was the same or some element of the team was the same, uh, or that they inherited the plans or they did something like that. And they do a typical thing. The later building emulates the earlier one in some ways, makes some improvements, which in some cases can be worse according to you know retrospective view but in their mind of course they're making an improvement and often they're just that little bit larger in some way or other so um anyway there's those two buildings and you can see a photograph of the amphitheater at Nîmes uh, there just to remind you what these buildings are like and needless to say proportions and elevation are important and uh, all, all of this now, when we uh, actually look at um, what we might consider to be a more definite case of copying, um, we have really quite to struggle to find them if we're talking about Roman antiquity. You might think that the column of Marcus Aurelius on the right is a copy of the column of Trajan, but it is and it isn't. It goes for the essential thing, which is a column 100 foot tall, that's, that's the main thing they want. And of course, there is the helical staircase that takes you up to a viewing platform at the top. But actually, they're quite complicated structures. Um, I think the column of Trajan in particular, which is more influential than its, late, its, its successor, um, people almost, you know, they, they, they focus on the relief, not realizing this is a very uh, sophisticated structure and it's really a building because you have an entrance door, you have a room, you have the staircase, you have windows, and you have the platform at the top and so on. And, it, and it's using enormously heavy blocks up to 75 tons. So uh, oh. prefabricated to a large extent in Carrara. And so it's not a, you know, it's not an easy uh, game. And in any case, when you get to the uh, later column, it is clearly modeled on the former, but there's several differences. So it doesn't have entesis. The relief is much stronger. Um, the capital, but it doesn't have entesis, is much taller and, and heavier at the top. You can see that they are raising it up on a taller pedestal and so on. Another example is um, the relationship between the arch of Septimius Severus or Severus and the Arch of Constantine, which is surely modeled on the former. It's a gap of 100 years or whatever, but you know, it's 300 meters away or something. So um, one influenced the other. And, but when, when you look at the design, you can actually find dimensional correspondences and they're actually basically the same width and height. But then when you go into, I'm sorry, I should say also there's certain obsessions about the square. There are a lot of one-to-one -one relationships <clears throat> um, centering on things like the column height and the overall height, and uh, more so in the Arch of Constantine, which you could think of in, in kind of gridded terms, whether you look in plan, uh, front elevation or uh, side elevation. I think this is perhaps because the architect was trying to get some definite coherence into what is a bit of a hodgepodge, really. I mean, it's combining all kinds of spolia and, and stuff. So um, the Arch of Constantine does it more so. But when you look in detail, you will find these correspondences between the build, two buildings and you'll find differences. For example, this, the lateral archway, and I hope everyone who's watching from wherever they are, but not in this room, can see this mouse, uh, that's a narrow, uh, aisle and here it's significantly wider so there was sort of if you like a critique of that side aisle perhaps they thought well the reliefs if we want we want to show reliefs, but we can't see them from the, that distance or whatever whether it's circulation there was uh, the thought that they need to um, change and there's other things that change so um, say so this kind of correspondence is relatively rare 
if you take a look at residential architecture or bath buildings, I mean, a bit like I said with amphitheaters, but much more so because of problems of orientation, heating, budget, and much more extreme, uh, you have all kinds of plans across the empire. You know, really, um, you, you, it's hard to imagine a more heterogeneous picture, um, endless variety. And then, of course, you have space for invention in these circumstances, and vaulting and all those things will change as technological progress um, comes in and encourages people to go for bigger spans or some more dramatic form of vaulting. And of course, there is always room for invention and creativity just, just because. So uh, in the case of a commission for Hadrian's Villa by Hadrian for his personal sanctuary, it's nothing like the context of the temples we've been looking at earlier. It's a, it's a, it's a private fantasy. It's, it's a little world in a world on its own. And so the architect comes up with a completely novel um, proposition. And this is, so this is basically to summarize, we're back on this thing of from imitation to invention, and you can choose your place on that spectrum according to the needs of individual um, projects and briefs and you know, the client's wishes and all these things. Now, uh, fast forwarding, we're going to look, still staying within the classical tradition, at a period where the question of revival comes in. And this, this changes things quite significantly because you are not assuming a continuity of practices that would have been, to a large extent, not even thought about that much. You would find certain writings and, and uh, so on, and there would have been methods and rules of thumb and, and maybe even semi-professional teams of people operating uh, in a sense like a modern office, but not in other senses. And you would have these um, traditions handed down, also orally and so on. And then you have this complete break. So when you get to the Renaissance, the Italian Renaissance in particular, you are having to revive, you know, it's, it's a rebirth, and that requires a more conscious sort of uh, orientation of your thought processes, and you are trying to work out how things were done so that you can do them. And um, so I've got, I've been, uh, had some ideas around uh, the Renaissance and then the neoclassical period, and then it's been great that David Hemsel, an old friend of mine, in fact, uh, the co-author with Paul Davis of my first article on the Pantheon. So he uh, has obviously been thinking about all these things over the decades as well. And he's got this wonderful book, um, Emulating Antiquity, uh, which is really focusing on the period between Brunelleschi and Michelangelo. And of course, Vasari comes into it. Uh, it's very important, you know, the whole idea of Vasari telling us about you know, his great idol, Michelangelo, who has made plenty of comments disparaging copying. I mean, this is, he thought was absolutely beneath the great master, and this is not the sort of thing uh, you did. In fact, he part of his whole persona was to make the distinction between other people who need to imitate and Michelangelo, who doesn't need to. You know, so um, you know, obviously, some of the, this you have to take it a little bit. Uh, not exactly tongue in cheek, I think he meant, but you have to actually relativize and look at the material. He too had his uh, imitative um, aspects. So what, what I want to, uh, it just so happens, let's say, that some of the themes I'm working on weren't the same as those that David has been working on. So while I can happily sort of um, support myself using David's book and, and the writings, of course, of others, um, I've just got a little sort of small contribution to make on this theme as regards the Renaissance. Because it seems to me rather fascinating that perhaps some of the first instances of what you might call copying, I'm using this rather loosely, also here that the term citation and referencing comes in, uh, is very important, of things that don't exist. So you, you might think, ah, oh, the most obvious thing is we've got the Pantheon, we've got the Colosseum, we've got you know, these arches, we, we copy them. Actually, there's, for all reasons which you'll probably know, there's all kinds of reasons why, you know, you're not going to build a Roman temple in 
Rome of the 15th and 16th century, uh, and you're not going to build an amphitheater. It's obvious, right? But you're wanting to revive that architecture. You're wanting to become skilled in using that vocabulary, and you are wanting to show that you understand all of this and your erudition and so on. So um, what we have here are two, two works by Raphael and Penny on the left and San Michele on the um, right. And they're all to do with the origins of the Doric order, which of course is entirely speculative. And it's referring to Vitruvius's text, which holds that these triglyphs were once made uh, of wood. Well, he didn't actually, correction, he never says that, but a lot of people have assumed he said that. He only says that triglyphs masked the end of the beams because they were ugly. And he wouldn't have wanted a constructional feature on, or the Greeks would not have wanted a constructional feature on the face of their temple. So, but anyway, uh, for these people, the, the beam end notion was important. So um, you can see Raphael using uh, the, the sort of, you can see a proto-Doric wooden temple with its beams there. And here's San Michele um, doing kind of very simplified triglyphs, which are supposed to recall these beam ends. So he's showing his erudition. And then um, I want to draw attention to these um, sketches of Antonio da, da San Gallo and also thank um, um, Peter Fain Saunders for his work in this area. So we've had happy um, discussions about this. And you, you have here a drawing uh, of Antonio da San Gallo, or rather two drawings. And one shows the mythical tomb of Lars Porsena, which we don't have, don't exist. We don't, I mean, it's, it's, it's entirely in the, the very dim um, you know, era before proper history. And we have a drawing that seems to be of the mausoleum at Hadeconassus, which of course does survive, one of the seven wonders of the world, but um, people in Italy back then would have known very little about it. So again, it's a textual thing, for, but in both cases, you're using Pliny. Okay, so he's reconstructing on the basis of Pliny these two monuments, and on, in particular, the tomb of Lars Porsena with these sort of conical, strange conical things at the corner. And there is one tomb not far from Rome in Albano, with the so-called tomb of the Arati and the Curati, where they, they do actually have four sort of conical or vaguely conical things. I don't know what they are at the corners. So erudite architects like Sangaro, you know, this is this is something that they could use. And you see in this project, St. Peter's, there's a sort of that, that one, it was it's, it's sort of moved up into on the top of the campanile. And there's other schemes where you can see the pepperings of this, this sort of device and allusions. And you can find um, also allusions to the mausoleum of Hadiconassus in some places. So actually they're citing things that didn't exist. They're citing textual things. So I think it's actually one of the, um, one of the ways in which people start to think about citation and, and copying. And it's a sort of forebear of what would happen. Because if you are going to make some allusion to that, you have to copy it closely enough so some people recognize it. Otherwise, if you like, you're, you're sort of wasting time. It's a, an entirely personal joke. So you have to be make it recognizable. And so you have to sort of follow Pliny's description um, to a fair degree. And here we have San Michele with these sorts of obelisk come meta corner things there seeming to have um, something to do with it, possibly. And then as far as the Muslim of Hadeconassus, um, we, we're obviously fast forwarding now to um, Britain and Hawksmoor. And then of course, uh, St. George's Bloomsbury actually has a sort of tall pyramid on top. And you'll notice that the height of it is quite comparable with the Sangalo drawing. Height. You know, it's, it's extremely steep, and no one thinks that the actual Muslim of Hadakanasis would have ever, ever had something so steep. And even and the, the whole thing's debated, but let's not go there. And so there is this tendency, say, to cite things that don't exist, don't exist. And the question of citing or copying, making recognizable, is um, becoming important. 
And then with the Greek revival, you get a very uh, definite change of gear. You suddenly get, get what you really can call copies of Greek buildings appearing, say, in Shropshire. So there on the left is the Monument of Lysicrates, and there in um, Shrugborough is Athenian Stuart's version. Now, um, you know, it's one exercise with these that, that um, I hope to complete, started but not finished, and there's lots more to do, of actually testing the dimensions and things to see how accurate they are. But in terms of this talk, that's actually a side issue because it doesn't affect the overall principle. Now, um, the, the, the device or the, the, what enables this, not just in Stuart, because obviously it's Stuart who contributed more than just contributed, you know, also with Rivette of the famous, their famous books on the Greek monuments, which were then diffused, but then the, all the recipients of those books could then engage in the same conversation. So the recognizability thing um, is important because this is a way of communicating that you know this new fashion, that you're up to date because your clients and your peers can recognize it. If you just did a free form version of what you think Greek buildings were like, probably people wouldn't understand what you're doing. I mean, you might have a great result depending on how good you are at it, but it's not, it's not really the point. Here you want to actually, in, in a sense, be part of a, a club. We're, we're Greek revival people and we want to show it and, and, and the, the patrons are, want to do the same. They want to be part of it. They have the books and, and the truth. And then you get the same thing happening in Germany and France and, uh, and then, in, then in the States. So um, now I just want to underline that point by just saying how different the situation was in Italy. As I said, you wouldn't, uh, for various reasons that are to do with function, uh, copy a Pantheon or a Colosseum in Rome in the Renaissance. But the other thing, even when you're back in Britain, you're referring to these buildings, that they were all so well known that it could have been considered a bit, a bit crass and certainly not uh, in tune with Michelangelo's views and the views of many others, if you were simply to reproduce well-known buildings from Rome in all over Britain, say. But these Greek buildings were not known because very few people went there. And for the most part, everyone relied on these books. So they had to be recognizable or else, as I say, you're, you, the, the, the game wouldn't work. Now, um, now we can also race over the next ones because, uh, in effect, this is the same message. You start getting copying on a wider basis. So there's the two ancient examples, and we get the first of them revisited in the, in the Place Vendôme, and then St. Petersburg, the notable example where there they don't do the spiral freeze, but they go for another wow factor, which is a single shaft of granite monolithic 660 tons. So, you know, but again, based on what people would think is the better of the two ancient precedents, the Column of Trajan. So um, this is something that also we interpret in terms of enlightenment culture. So we have a, a period in which people for some time now have been thinking about categorizing things, writing encyclopedias, um, creating museums, making plaster casts of famous antiquities and all, all these things and others contribute to this uh, mindset. So the, the Greek revival uh, sort of idea of uh, re recognition that I'm going on about then needs to be sort of added to all of this. So the movement um, uh, progresses and it can affect details. For example, this is the um, Temple of Castor with its famous entwined um, helices, which are highly recognizable because they're highly unique. Well, there were a couple of other examples in antiquity, but no one would have known them. Uh, so um, then you find them being drawn, drawn more lovingly and carefully, and they appear at Cambridge. They appear at Chiswick House, um, Packington Hall, and then Cressy and Taylor. Oh, sorry, this is Suez, first of all, and then Cressy and Taylor uh, produce these very, very large and detailed plates for people to copy. You have plaster casts in the Soane Museum. 
And so Soan has a go. Um, the Board of Trade doesn't get built. You have the Birmingham Town Hall, um, the National Gallery, and I haven't added examples from France. There's one in Montpellier, another in Paris. And only yesterday I opened the book in the um, Scroop Terrace Library and came across another example uh, in Denmark that I hadn't ever seen before. So, you know, there's plenty of those out there. And then, so, so this, is a, this is a different operation. Uh, you know, we're just talking about details. So the, the, there's the two things. And then, uh, um, then there's the whole question of, say, of how accurately things fit. Now, I'm, I'm just wanting to make a little confession here because um, this is an image from my book, Origins of Classical Architecture, which is captioned incorrectly. And I think it's quite funny. Someone wrote, to, I hadn't noticed, no one had noticed until, you know, something three years later, a friend in Germany said, oh, by the way, do you really? Oh, <laughs> yes. So I, uh, the caption actually reads the basis of the Eric Theon. Bit silly, but obviously they're not ruined enough for the Eric Theon. They're actually from Hansen's building there. And I, you know, it's probably late at night, whatever, but the image, go, uh, put it in there and don't think twice about it. And of course they're so similar, um, being possibly the same size and everything, but you, you know, anyway, so there you are, it just goes to show. So um, there would, I say there would be lots to do in terms of comparing just how faithfully these copies are made. But um, it becomes, in a sense, a bit of a cult at that point. You're obviously recognized, these buildings are obviously recognized. It's no more so much the recognition factor as when they were first used, but now it's a real a question of, of, let's say, highly sophisticated academic, and it's a question of rigor and, and all, all of this. So, um, so this is the uh, Hanson and the original on the right. Now, remember that in the 19th century, it's, there's the Battle of the Styles. There's um, all kinds of, uh, well, let's say, not, not, not brilliant buildings being built here and there, um, more or less cobbled together with more or less degrees of understanding. And it's not a particularly happy picture. And you also get then completely mechanical um, industrial products using classical forms. And it's not surprising that you get a backlash. So I, I'm just using Los here to represent a whole cohort of people who are around um, that period in the early 20th century who, um, I don't think it's quite as simple as saying or, or ornament was a crime, but he, he suggested that notion into the minds of people who really think it is. Um, anyway, so then you uh, loosen, start stripping it down. And so the ornamental side disappears. And the, because of the didactic and polemical character of someone like Loos's writings and then Cabuzio's writings and those of others, you have this quick, clean sweep uh, away of history. And that leads, and, and the, the love of the tabula rasa type notion, which I alluded to at the beginning as being a kind of designer's ideal. So you get history um, swept out and you get the baby swept out with the bathwater. This is the problem. But when you actually look at the history of the 20th century, it's not so different in broad historical terms than it was before in the sense that the idea at the time is this was styleless. But of course, as we all know, it wasn't styleless. And you can date and spot buildings from certain periods and you can stop, spot influence going from one architect to another and so on, you know, Cabuzier's influence on Britain, for example. And you get, in effect, variations on a the theme. And then you have an, an architect, here's uh, Pierre Koenig in his uh, case study houses with sort of variations of the same constructional system. And this, he's got the word there, variations, clearly. And then I'm just going to jump forward to the work of Allies and Morrison for no particular reason that Bob very kindly, uh, uh, well, the practice is a good proponent of this, this kind of work. Um, excellent, I should say. And thanks to Bob, who kindly supplied me with these images. So I've just picked a few that should, uh, by themselves, convey a certain form uh, sense of, of um, commonality, of emulation. So the practice over a series of years has tried 
certain solutions that seem to work with say um, student housing and so on, and then you uh, improve hopefully the next version according to budget and so on. And it's really uh, a point that this is entirely normal in all kinds of realms of life. Here we have the VW Golf, very irritatingly, the seventh is top left. I always begin top left and go bottom right, but uh, this person's uh, obviously different, uh, but it's a nice image to have. And we could talk about Chippendale chairs. We could talk about Italian cooking. We could talk just about almost anything. And variations on the theme is a source of uh, usually great pleasure and a, and a certain utility as well. So they sort of go hand in hand. And then back to that image of um, capitals in ancient practice. And just so to make sure I didn't forget to make this point, um, both about the theory and Vitruvius and symmetry and harmony, and this fact of uh, variation, you have the familial resemblance, and then you have all of the little features or traits that give the individual uh, product its character. So it's part of a family, but it has a character. So that individual is different to all the other members of a family. So now with that word character, I'm gonna try and segue into my, seamlessly I should do, into the next uh, section, which is a um, much briefer than the first and relatively rapid. It's a run through of this um, project that I'm now working on. And I just should say one of those, uh, well, I should say really alleluia serendipity, really, because occasionally you get a good break. Uh, you know, life can be hard and academia can be terrible grudge. But, you know, it, sometimes every now and then something uh, amazing happens. So there was me writing my first grant application for um, this project from emulation to replication. And I get, before I actually submit it, I get a phone call in effect that leads to me acting as an architect doing emulation and replication. In, in practice. And also having never been a classical architect, this, well, by, by, by you know, Pat Forza, I had to do it classical. And when you've been studying it that long, well, it becomes a pleasure. So now the challenge is, is not to be one of these copyists. Or so the thing is that I have to say, I love the architecture of the 16th century almost as much as that of ancient Roman Greece possibly even more and you have the the model of something like the tempietto in in my mind since i was a, a young man this is a, sort of one of the the greatest examples of how you can uh, cr you can create a tradition you can create a new model even out of eclecticism and hybridity so the um, this doesn't look like any ancient structure it's borrowed intensely from all kinds of sources, from ancient round temples, from medieval baptistry, from the sketches of Francesco de Giorgio, those of uh, Leonardo da Vinci and, and others. And, and yet the fusion is completely, has its own character. It's, it's completely its own boss. And it's so much its own boss that it's created rules and um, a language that the architect that gives it coherence. And so despite its eclecticism, it doesn't feel eclectic. And if I could manage that, that, that would be my uh, sort of dream. So in doing this, taking on this new project, uh, I together with the, the patron, we decided that you know, we don't want either him or I uh, opening a book for a while or a magazine, keeping off, just, 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 just starting from first principles that's an embarrassing first drawing, but it literally was my first drawing. And then, okay, then you get it um, uh, transformed to make something uh, visually more pleasing. And this, I should say, should say first of all, um, well, no, let's let's leave that for later. Um, you can see that it you develop a building from principles. You have in mind an H plan. Oh, that was the, the premise. Then actually the rotunda comes in to the frame and some sense of grouping services in that gray zone. Then you can actually generate uh, the building. 
uh, basically. And initially things sit on the grid lines, but you'll notice that actually in the definitive plan, things no longer are often on grid lines. And um, the little blue lines you now hopefully can see will show you a few places where things set off grid because you have so many considerations to bear in mind that you know, um, whether it's aesthetic or technical, that um, the thing flexes. And um, you have this very big and long structure that is determined by the fact of a ridge that is level and straight. So whereas in, in some uh, circumstances, I prefer to do an animated, more picturesque sort of Roman agency villa kind of thing. In this case, the site was like that and it's gonna be straight and big and if you like, imperial. So then one of the main aspects of the project was how to uh, soften it, how to give it a more sort of, um, how to let it settle into the landscape. I, I don't really want to use the picturesque but it can come with particular connotations, but in a sense, uh, that's also um, the part of it. So that's a, uh, a rendering of the project and that gives you a feeling for what's been built so far. And said so in, in trying to soften or break up, articulate the project, one of my key sort of obsessions was with symmetry and asymmetry. So um, a lot of the time, I think symmetry is overused in terms of classical practice, particularly contemporary classical practice, because it's sort of like, oh, it's classical, it's probably symmetrical. Well, certain things do have to be symmetrical, entrances, main elevations and so on, but then other things don't, and I think actually suffer if they are. And so it's been a lot of thinking and playing about basically with symmetry and asymmetry. And so um, also using elements of Roman practice, you'll see that this is the elevation we were just looking at in the photograph. Um, it's, you've got four over three, and you can't see it so well, uh, three over two uh, or, or uh, and three over three only at the center. So the center is completely symmetrical. The rest is not so, which means uh, if one's done it right, that your eye sort of, you're, it's more dynamic and more interesting, but and ultimately the eye wanders around and, um, and it maybe pulls you around in terms of actually walking and visiting, but you're always coming back to the center. So there's a hierarchical distinction between uh, the main party piece and the sides. And this kind of um, uh, approach, you can see it's under construction. That's the kind of thing that's emerging, hasn't yet got its pergola or the windows or you know, various things. Uh, and in terms of the side elevation, again, you'll see that instead of putting these two sort of tower elements or um, by which I mean this one and that one, they are deliberately offset. And also there's functional things. You see this, this frames up an entrance court and will be very little used except for circulation. Whereas this is there also for enjoyment. So you come out of the reception rooms and you can move around and you can, you can enjoy the shade and so on. So they have different functions. So they're, they're shifted with respect to the center. And then there's various other things that happen. You'll see that that column sits over a window and things don't necessarily correlate in a way you might, you might think, but it's not completely random because classical stuff isn't random in the sense of some uh, contemporary construction. So there will be a rhythm that means that you're coming back and you're aligning or not aligning exactly. And it's the same sort of thing for the entrance and in and for other areas of the project that I won't show you for motives of time. And here you can see particularly those white columns are not doing what you'd expect. They don't align. And I think that's fine. That's what concrete is here for. Um, and this is just an image to show you the kind of world uh, created in the, the first phase, which is the, the, the phase uh, showed from the initial photograph. Um, and there it's been uh, great to experiment with uh, all these rules of classical design that I showed you earlier. And I, sorry, I used the word rules and I should never do that. They're principles. Um, <clears throat> and you can actually use that same framework to create capitals that aren't Corinthian. This, you can see, is sort of related to Corinthian. This isn't at all 
Um, I, I don't know what that is, but anyway, it happened. Um, but it's sort of partly archaic, partly Hellenistic. Um, and you can see we're in a tropical climate. It, it's trying to be a little bit alluding to palm, palm stuff. So it, it, it's just like one of those. So um, you can use it in the same way you can flex and it, it's a useful starting point, but I've never actually checked whether the final result conforms. I suspect it, it wouldn't because as you tweak, as you align a base molding with a skirting or you do whatever else you're doing, that base is going to shift and you probably won't bother to adjust the capital because you've already done it and you know all kinds of things come into it. So, um, but, uh, and just the detail to give you uh, a sense of, I mean, the joys of working with good craftsmen who actually, this is a robotic product. So you were talking about craftsmen almost at the level of working inside your computer to then getting it done. There's these, it's a skilled operation and then there's hand finishing to get that kind of surface um, and I think time is up in terms of we don't need to just do any more about that. But just to look at this, this actually is more or less a copy because from a research project, I happen to have this ancient capital um, in my computer, so to speak. So it was the only ionic uh, in the project and it, it just, the proportions just suited that situation. And and so why do it, why do it from scratch? Uh, on another case uh, here, there's a little invention here that I quite like, and I'm really going to conclude with, um, is it may not be obvious to you, but essentially the triglyph on, say, the Parthenon there is always a straight rectangular object. And you may notice that here there's a little sort of rounding that wouldn't be on any I don't I've never come across it so let's just say it's a novelty and it's inspired by this sort of little obsession in that book origins of classical architecture about the tripod and being a possible um, contributor not the sole source but a one of the contrib uh, contributing elements to the story of the Doric frieze which is quite whoops quite uh, complex, but essentially you're going from all kinds of freezes that act on the field and divider mechanism. Then you get one with um, representations of tripods in the place that we might expect tri uh, triglyphs to be. And this one here is a Hellenistic tripod come triglyph freeze. So I think that person was onto something. So the version that we've done is is got a little, little inflection there that I was showing you, and the two little discs there that are supposed to allude to that. Most people won't notice, that, that's fine. Um, but I found it quite enjoyable. And what it does is it gives you that specificity to design that, that has your hand and mind connection working. So whatever other proportions and things you change are, or in this case, introducing a rosette, so that it divides up these things, then sets up something of interest or, or pleasure. Um, and you possibly lose sight of why you originally did it. It's, it's a quite a, a convoluted process. We're under construction. And then I will just leave you um, with one photograph of um, work in progress. And at this point, I just have a few words I wanted to say um, at the end. And uh, really on sort of lessons learned, I, this is a sort of personal thing, just the lessons I've learned. I can't speak for other, other people. Um, <clears throat> but first of all, on the pleasures of team working, because, uh, you know, uh, lots of many of you either, I assume all academics or maybe about to be. Um, so it can be, you have this engagement with students, but then it can actually be quite solitary as you in your room. But the lovely thing about architectural practice is you actually involved with a big team of people. And so I have my own team and I want to thank um, Jacob Ring in particular, uh, Victoria Schultz, Harry Wyatt, Sebastian Strip, and, and others. And of course, then there's the, the consultants, people that actually make it happen. And of course the patron without whom nothing of this would happen. So um, I think that's just one thing. Um, and then I think, you know, you can, you can have an insight doing this into the certain tricks that designers um, use to to play with formality and informality. Um, I've 
been enjoying that syncopation thing and I know how you know examples in antiquity did it and so be interesting to see whether they work in practice um, and I think essentially other lessons are distinguishing what's really important from the negotiable and um, <laughs> It's such a wonderful, supple, legible and durable language, the classical, so that you can create new things while maybe doing a bit of copying, while imitating to a greater or lesser extent, but above all, by applying principles and manipulating them, um, which then gravitate towards solutions. And at a certain point, you then may need to go back and check with your forebears how they did it because why not? In that way, you can stand on the shoulders of giants, as, as in the phrase. So you, you, you've got to help up to whatever you do. So a long live the spectrum from imitation to invention. And um, the, on, on, let's say, defending the, 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 the championing of the classical movement, I would say, rather than copying, the real generative motor of, of any tradition uh, of this kind is the variation on the themes created through the manipulation of assimilated principles in the end of sustaining the character you've identified for that project. So it's a bit like a character in a novel. You know, if, if the protagonist is going to have a character, there's certain things the author has got to do to, to build that up, to sustain it. So it's, it's believable. So really that's um, virtual, except for concluding comment. So while um, previous publications I've done have been aimed essentially at, at um, academic audience, occasionally at architects, the sort of undercurrent of stuff that minority of architects who will read it might enjoy. But I really, uh, I think time has come uh, really to try and get this message out there more widely to the community of practitioners. And I'm pleased to say I've recently become uh, chair of the traditional architecture group and are now affiliated with INTBAU. And I hope also that through the auspices of this wonderful new um, venture with the, funded by the Axon Johnson Foundation, that a, some new life can, can be um, brought to the um, strengthening tradition of contemporary classicism and the wider use of tradition and the vernacular and so on in contemporary practice.